Science of climate is uh, one of the most intellectually stimulating enterprises in all of science. And although it's portrayed by the media as being wholly devoted to the global warming problem, it's much richer than that. We're proud to have assembled uh, today two panels of some of the very best scientists working on climate science and climate risks. The first panel addresses some of the frontiers of climate science and will be moderated by my MIT colleague, Noel Salin. Noel is an associate professor in the Institute for Data, Systems, and Society and the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. Her research uses atmospheric chemistry modeling to inform decision-making on air pollution, climate change, and hazardous substances such as mercury and persistent organic pollutants. Uh, please welcome Noel. And as the panel is, um, and the panelists, as the panel is walking up, let me uh, say to you that uh, if you wish to ask questions to the panelists, uh, you can uh, text them in. And I think the instructions for doing that are going to appear up on the screen shortly. And Noel will introduce the panelists to you. Well, thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, this panel is entitled Frontiers in Climate Science, and we have five distinguished panelists here to talk about that topic. I'm hoping to have an in-depth discussion about what we know, what we don't know, and what those are, who are at the frontiers of climate science are thinking about. Uh, so to introduce our panel from, uh, from starting at the far end, uh, Ray Pierre Humbert, professor of physics at the University of Oxford, who works on climate dynamics of planets and policy-relevant aspects of the physics of anthropogenic climate change. Uh, we have David McGee from here, from our um, Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences, whose research focuses on understanding the atmosphere's responses to past climate changes. Uh, we have uh, Tapio Schneider, who is at Caltech, whose research develops theories of climate and advances climate modeling to better understand and predict climate changes. Uh, we have Nikki Gruber, uh, who's a professor at ETH Zurich, uh, expert on global biogeochemical cycles of carbon and other biologically essential elements and interactions with the climate system. And Paul O'Gorman, also here in our uh, Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences, who's interested in the dynamics of the atmosphere, the hydrological cycle, and climate change. So I'm going to start right out uh, with directing a question to Bray about what happens to the climate when we add greenhouse gases like CO2, uh, changing radiative forcing. Uh, Susan introduced the, climate of, the concept of climate sensitivity, which tells us something about that. So what is climate sensitivity, and what do we know about it? Yeah, so it's actually been known since the uh, initial work of Fourier back in, 19, back in 1827 that uh, planetary temperature is determined by the requirement that you have a balance between the energy you receive from the sun and the energy you re-emit to space in the form of infrared radiation. When you add carbon dioxide to an atmosphere, you disrupt that energy balance, and the planet has to warm up to some extent to bring things back into, into balance. So climate sensitivity is how much you warm up for any given amount of CO2 that you add, that you add to the atmosphere. And I want to emphasize that the individual components of the climate system, the physics of the individual components, rest on physics that has been very, very well verified over the past hundred years, thermodynamics, radiative transfer, interaction of radiation with matter, uh, it's quantum theory, things like that. So the challenge in climate science is a challenge in understanding the collective behavior of many components that you understand when they're all put together interacting. And so uh, the basic physics of, of the, the way CO2 affects radiation are, are very, very well understood. It's the other things that happen once you throw things out of equilibrium that, are, that become complicated. Now, there are various feedbacks that go into determining how much the planet has to warm. One of them is the fact that as a planet gets warmer, if you have an ocean around, uh, you will have more water vapor in the atmosphere. After many years of hard work, I think we understand that feedback quite well. It's not as straightforward as people thought, but, but we do understand that. But the hard feedback, and the thing that accounts for most of our uncertainty and how much the world will warm and can actually give us possibly some, or some really scary warming, are clouds. So clouds, uh, clouds uh, affect the energy budget of the planet in many, many ways. Uh, and they involve uh, interactions between uh, things happening on time scales from millimeters out to thousands of, thousands of kilometers. Uh, and they're not uh, uh, simply responsive to temperature. Uh, you don't necessarily get more clouds in a warmer climate or, or less. 
uh, it, it requires a, a, a lot of collective interaction between physics and many different scales. And so if I had to highlight the one reason uh, that, uh, that we really don't know exactly how bad it's going to get, uh, it's, it, it would be clouds and primarily low clouds. So I will say that you know, research I've done, many people have done, and work on paleoclimate says that it's extremely, extremely unlikely that there's some mystical cloud feedback that is strong enough to save us from global warming. Uh, the, the general consensus is that clouds could make the situation uh, a whole lot worse, but there's very little prospect that will, it will save us. So you talked about uh, how bad it's going to get, but we've just heard that the top 30 hottest years on record are all in most of the lifetimes of people in this room. Uh, so if this is so different, David, you study uh, past climates. Um, what can we learn from the past, given that we're in a world that's fundamentally different from what we've experienced before? Right, so, so the on record speaks to the instrumental record, which extends back 100 or 150 years. If we want to look at anything else in the 4.5 billion years of Earth history, we need to turn to natural archives that encode information about the environment as they grow. So this could be the ice cores that Susan talked about, deep sea sediments, tree rings, corals, et cetera. And the great thing about them is they allow us to look at climates that occurred in conditions quite different from today and quite different than we've been able to directly observe. So for example, we can look back at the last time the Earth was up at around 400 ppm CO2 uh, uh, during a time called the Pliocene about three to five million years ago. And we see that on average, Earth was about two to three degrees C warmer. In the Arctic, it was roughly 10 degrees C warmer during summers. Ecosystems were fundamentally different in the Arctic. Regional precipitation patterns were, were different, in, different in ways that we're just beginning to understand. And sea level was roughly 60 feet higher. Uh, there was no ice in Greenland substantially less ice in Antarctica. So we can look at that and say, not as an analog of where we're heading in the next couple of decades, but as a way of testing the same theories and models that we use to project the future. So as we think about where we're heading, uh, we've seen these large changes in the past. Uh, I'll turn to Tapio. How do we think about um, what happens to the climate under different scenarios? Uh, what do we do to do that? What we do to understand what happens under different scenarios. So I think Dave, the Pliocene is good. It tells you where we are headed on timescales of centuries if we keep 400-some ppm CO2 in the atmosphere. But what we really need to know is what happens in the next few decades. And we need to know now and very urgently. It, I think it has become clear the public discussion really has shifted dramatically from mitigation being the main focus to adaptation being something that we'll just have to contend with. Adaptation means massive investment in infrastructure, seawalls in Miami or New York and the like. Uh, risk management in the developing world, and we need to know what we, what we need to adapt to. Um, we use climate models for predictions. We use climate models to say how the world will change. However, now we are at the point that we need models to make investments worth trillions of dollars, is what is being discussed in infrastructure investments over the next decade. And our models aren't quite good enough for that, I think. There's the issues with the clouds. There's one that Ray mentioned. We can't quite say how clouds change, so hence we can't quite, quite say how much warmer it will get. Hence we can't quite say how much more extreme rainfall you might get in Boston or how dry it might get in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the models aren't good enough primarily because these clouds involve small-scale processes that Susan talked about that we cannot explicitly compute. Um, and there is no way that we will be able to explicitly compute them anytime soon. The, the, the number of scales involved there is so huge it's not going to happen. So to give you a sense to describe the atmosphere completely on a computer, you need 10 to the 22 numbers, order of magnitude. So that's not going to happen. It's the number of molecules in a computer chip, so this is not feasible anytime soon. So, however, that's sort of the bad part. Clouds are hard, and various other small-scale processes, ocean turbulence are hard, and we can't quite capture them. But I think there's a golden age to make progress here, A, simply because we have to. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a societal, economical imperative that we make progress. But I, I think also we can. We have data like we never had before. The Earth is just the best observed fluid system now, Earth, Earth atmosphere and ocean. We have decades of good space-based measurements, ground-based measurements that haven't informed climate models to the degree they can yet. And we have computational capabilities that we can use, for example, to simulate clouds or ocean turbulence, not on the globe, but we can do it in, in smaller areas. And 
tools in the data sciences have seen rapid advances. And I think if you want to make progress in predicting Earth and managing Earth, you need to put all of these together, the data we have, the computational capabilities we have, and learning methods and the like that, that have seen rapid advances in the data science. And I think that, to me, is how we can get to better climate models that can guide the investments we have to make. Just to give you a sense of the scale and, and, and why all, all of you who are young here should get involved in that, the, the estimated economic value of reducing uncertainties in climate predictions by half over the next 10 years is trillions of US dollars. So an investment of a few million dollars in research can return trillions of dollars in societal benefit, and that's why we have to do it. That's a great point. It's a trillion dollar challenge. <laughs> uh, so when we think about what the atmosphere actually means for life on Earth, uh, turn to Nikki. How will ecosystems on land and ocean respond to climate change and these, uh, these extremes that are projected? I think that's one of the big uncertainties that we're facing because just take, for example, the climate change that we have right now. On the one hand, actually rising CO2 is actually quite positive for forests. We actually see an increase in carbon uptake as a result of the increasing CO2. On the other hand, we have changes in temperature, we have changes in storms, we have droughts, and they have very strong impacts. And, but how actually these two pieces can come together and really actually change and alter the both actually natural ecosystem, but also human managed ecosystem. I think we should also not forget about those. Uh, is, is something that we have actually not a lot of clout on right now. And it's also relevant directly from the, the perspective of the global carbon budget and global warming, because these ecosystems at the moment are incredibly efficient in taking up CO2. So about a quarter of the total emissions of all the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere is actually currently taken up by the land biosphere. And another quarter is actually taken up by the ocean, mostly by physical processes. But there's also these physical processes and the chemical changes, and as Susan talked about, actually also changing the ocean acidity, uh, what we call ocean acidification. That will have impact on the ecosystem there. And that could lead to changes back in atmospheric CO2. So we need to understand these ecosystem responses, both for the purpose of what these ecosystems do, provide food and shelter and other services to humankind, but also in the context of the garden problem. So how can we go about this? I think uh, the topic you mentioned, we're actually wonderful in terms of observations. I think when it comes to ecosystems, I think we definitely need a big push in our observing capabilities. And that can involve, for example, rapid massive data sciences in the terms of microchips and micro-observing systems that allow essentially to kind of get an idea about the complexity uh, of, that we have out there. Uh, it involves actually all the way from genomic methodologies, understanding what is actually the basis of life and how it's organized, all the way in the biogeochemical cycles issues, which is really what I'm working on. I think what we need to do is really bring the community, the different expertise together in really making a big step forward for this very important problem. So picking up on this idea of complexity, uh, Susan drew attention to the fact that climate change is very different in different parts of the world, not only for our contribution to the problem, but also to the impacts. Climate change is expect expected to affect different regions of the world very differently. So Paul, how do we dis understand the physical factors that determine regional responses to climate? Yeah, I was struck by Susan's list of countries uh, in terms of emissions, and I've been thinking about different regions in terms of how Climate change affects things like rainfall. Um, and so a good example could be for extreme rainfall. It was just mentioned that um, you know, many countries will see increases at about a rate of 6% for degree warming in the amount of rainfall. But some, some countries, a few, will see, we expect will see much larger increases, double or more than that. An example would be India. Uh, many models project larger increases. And when you see a, a, a big disparity like that, it's usually due to a change in the circulation of the atmosphere. So not the temperature, it's water vapor exactly uh, directly, but the, through the winds changing, how the circulation patterns. For, so for extreme rainfall, it could be the updraft speed in heavy rainfall producing weather systems. But it also could be a change, for example, for drought in the jet stream, where the jet stream is located. So climate change can cause the jet stream to move further north or south. Currently, we think if warming in the tropics uh, tends to push it north, or poleward, I should say, and warming in the Arctic tends to push it uh, equatorward. And so this is a, an emergent behavior of a very complex system that we need to understand. 
Um, and so there is, we've made a lot of progress on that, but there's still a lot of outstanding questions in, under, in bringing up this understanding of how the circulation changes. I think the path forward is partly uh, things that Tapio mentioned, uh, making better models um, uh, using machine learning and other methods, that's really important. But even if you know, we, we improve our models, we can't treat them like black boxes. We need to understand, um, we need to have some understanding of the physical mechanism, I think, to have a credible prediction. This is a difference between weather forecasting and climate prediction on, on long time scales. So it's a, that, the circulation changes are a fascinating problem. It's things people at MIT learn about all the time, fluid dynamics, uh, radiative transfer, et cetera. And uh, it's, it's a, a scientific problem that's both fascinating and has a lot of societal impacts. Thanks. We have a follow-up question from the audience that really speaks to this, and I'm going to direct it to Tapio. Um, the question is, what are the largest sources of significant uncertainty in climate, current climate models? In one word for all of them, I think, is clouds, but that's, that's several sources of uncertainty. So there is, clouds are sustained by turbulence, so there's a question of how does the turbulence in the atmosphere change as the climate changes. And clouds consist of droplets and ice crystals, and each one of them at its center has a condensation nucleus, and the processes of how these droplets and ice crystals form are called microphysical processes because they happen on, on, on scales of micrometers. They're affected by air pollution. Smog, for example, can change the, uh, the number of droplets in a cloud, which changes the reflectivity. That's a whole another set of processes that right now is poorly understood. And I think the big news in the climate science of the last few years and slowly coming out is that it seems that some of these aerosol effects on clouds are stronger than estimated. And what they do is they lead to more reflective clouds. So that means if they are stronger and pollution had been increasing over the 20th century, there should have been more cooling. And if there was more cooling, then that means that the climate system must be more sensitive to greenhouse gases than we thought, because in order to reproduce the 20th century temperature record. So the, the, these aerosol pollution uncertainties give a bit of a double whammy for predicting what will happen. So even if you do what Susan talked about, for example, this, go cold turkey on carbon emissions, you stabilize emissions, you stabilize concentrations, set emissions to zero, you get some extra warming simply from cleaning up the air, just not emitting all the pollution that goes along with fossil fuel burning. And that extra warming, right now it looks like that it's larger than we thought, but it also means that the warming that you still get thereafter just from the CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere then also has to be larger than we thought. That's uh, one large uncertainty that's sort of doubly bad. And there's a number of other uncertainties. I mean, Nikki mentioned the carbon cycle. We can talk more about it, how much carbon the biosphere takes up, ocean turbulence, how much heat the oceans take up, and the like. There's a, a longer list going down. <laughs> OK. So I'm going to take another question from the audience here, and I'm going to direct this one to, to Ray. Is there any possibility that in the very, very long term, due to anthropogenic global warming, Earth could be put on a trajectory towards a Venus-like climate? Well, that's, that's a terrific question. Um, uh, the, 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 the basic physics of the runaway, one runaway greenhouse, which is believed to have led to Venus losing its ocean, uh, relies on a situation where, uh, where uh, you have so much water vapor feedback uh, that as you make the planet warmer and the planet tries to radiate more, more uh, energy to space, you get so much more water vapor in the atmosphere that rather than just stabilizing at an amplified warming, you can't get rid of the heat. And this process only ends when your entire ocean has evaporated into the atmosphere. Then it breaks up and it evaporates to space. Now, now uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the, uh, the threshold for getting into a runaway greenhouse depends on the amount of absorbed solar radiation. You have to have a certain amount of sunlight absorbed in order to sustain a runa runaway greenhouse. And so uh, increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere could change the amount of absorbed sunlight through changing the cloud albedo. And the Earth is, is uncomfortably close to the threshold of a runaway greenhouse. So it is possible to imagine a scenario involving clouds disappearing and the whole atmosphere becoming saturated with water vapor. Right now, the atmosphere 
is very unsaturated with regard to water vapor, where it's, it's not completely inconceivable that uh, these changes could push us into a runaway. Uh, but, but generally speaking, uh, the, the estimates are that the amount of carbon, unless there's a big surprise with clouds, which is always in the offing, the possibility, uh, it's extremely, extremely unlikely that, uh, that we're going to turn into Venus. And what paleoclimate gives you one of the bigger indications that this probably is not going to happen, because if it were going to happen, it probably would have happened about 50, 000, 50 million years ago during the event called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, when the sun was about as bright as it is now, and there was a huge pulse of carbon from natural uh, land surface carbon releases. Uh, and it did not trigger a, run, a runaway greenhouse. But now, I, uh, I, I, uh, I'm reluctant to, talk, to sort of shoot down this notion that, to, to discuss the runaway greenhouse uh, in the context of, of, of anthropogenic global warming. But people say, oh, oh well, gee, we ducked a bullet. We're not going to turn into, uh, into Venus. That, it's not so bad. <laughs> but but the, fact, <laughs> the fact is that uh, uh, there are lots and lots of really bad things that can happen to you short of turning into Venus. And one of the, <laughs> uh, one of the, one of the examples is that uh, at, at global mean warmings of somewhere around six to eight degrees, uh, your, the ability of mammals to lose heat can disappear. And then uh, uh, half the world can become uninhabitable for mammals outdoors. Uh, and that, that does not require turning into Venus. So, so so, so let's I talk think we about, should worry about that. Let's talk about what we can learn from the past. Direct a question to David. What can warm periods in our geological past teach us about future changes in ice sheets and sea level rise? Well, so they, they provide natural experiments, of course, in, in warming the world and having ice respond. Um, in general, what they teach us is that ice is surprisingly responsive. So one of the, the, the sort of benchmark periods that people look at is the last interglacial period, this period about 125,000 years ago, um, a time when CO2 levels were roughly at pre-industrial levels, but because of shifts in Earth's orbit, cyclical shifts in Earth's orbit, there was a little bit more, the, basically the poles were tilted a little bit more toward the sun, um, and so there was a little bit more melting of the polar ice caps. This time was not so different from today in terms of mean global temperature, and yet sea levels were six to nine meters higher uh, than, they, than they are today. And it's, it's been really challenging to understand exactly why that minimal amount of warming led to this, this rate, uh, sorry, this amount of uh, sea level rise. I think the key question for the paleo community is to really quantify where was that ice um, and, and which, which ice sheet melted, and also the rate of, of ice sheet melting. How quickly did it happen? Um, and those are still... Um, those are still uncertainties. We're also really working to narrow that uncertainty. The difference between six and nine meters is almost all of West Antarctica. And so uh, understanding whether it was six or nine is really important if you're an ice sheet modeler. So another question about the ocean. I'm going to put this one out to the panel, whoever wants to deal with that. Um, so if CO2 absorbs energy, why does more CO2 lead to warming? And what happens with glaciers and reflection of energy back and forth? Shouldn't this lead to cooling? Yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you shouldn't really think of CO2 as, as just absorbing energy, because it's, it's a property from quantum theory that, uh, that called Kirchhoff's law that anything that absorbs photons also emits them. And so what, what carbon dioxide does is it, it kind of intercepts the hot photons coming up from the ground, and it replaces them from photons radiated at a colder temperature of the upper atmosphere. But in this sense, uh, CO2 is planetary insulation. Uh, when you put pink fiberglass insulation in your house, it doesn't actually generate heat but it just reduces the rate at which you lose heat from the inside to the outside at a given temperature uh, of the inside. And now while your, your fire, fiberglass insula insulation reduces this heat flux uh, by reducing the turbulent heat flux rather than infrared heat flux, CO2 thermodynamically has the same effect except it's doing it like low emissivity glass. It's doing it by, uh, doing it by changing the infrared energy balance. And so it, it, it means that with the same amount of energy supplied by the sun, which is our furnace, uh, it, the surface has to get hotter in order to, in order to lose uh, energy at the, at the correct rate. So it's no different from putting on a sweater. The same physics applies, essentially. That's a great clarification. 
So as we think about the carbon cycle and carbon storage, I want to direct a question to Nikki. Uh, we have a question about aquatic vegetation and what the prospects are for aquatic vegetation to be a carbon sink. We've looked at this question actually quite intensely in the last IPCC report on the ocean and cryosphere that just got published last week. Uh, sort of the context in which this is happening, the, the kind of the political discussion uh, is called blue carbon. So this may be the, maybe you have heard about in this context. Um, there is potential actually for, for these uh, blue carbon ecosystems. We're talking particularly about mangrove forests, but also seagrass forests. Uh, also salt marshes to take up extra CO2. But in terms of magnitude, uh, our best estimate is of the order of maybe two tenths of a petagram of carbon. So what is two tenths of a petagram of carbon compared to current emissions, which is about 10? Uh, so this is a tiny amount. So I don't think we should rely on these natural ecosystems to save us from really reducing emissions. Uh, so I think the the benefit, essentially, of these ecosystems actually come through other means. These ecosystems are actually tremendously important from a biodiversity point of view. These ecosystems are very important as a, nur as a nurturing ground and feeding ground for fish and other uh, important species, that are, like for shrimps, that are economically important. And perhaps, as we talk about sea level, perhaps one of the most important uh, services that these ecosystems can provide to humankind is to act as a kind of a barrier for, for uh, dealing, essentially, with the sea level rise, particularly in countries that do not have the resources to build big sea walls or have very expensive means of, of moving cities around or making them uh, sea level proof. So I have a, a question for Paul here. We're only at the beginning of October, um, in, but we're already looking forward to winter. What <laughs> effects does climate change have on extremes like snowfall? Uh, for snowfall, we're yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mentioned extreme rainfall earlier, which is projected to increase almost everywhere. Not quite, but almost everywhere. But for snowfall, it's a more complicated story. Uh, mean snowfall is projected to decline with warming. and um, it's probably, it's a little bit too early just because of there's a large <clears throat> internal unforced variability in our climate system. So the number of snowstorms you get a year, it's hard to, there isn't quite enough good statistics to tell if that's happening already. Um, but the um, extremes of snowfall are more complicated because they often happen on certain days when it's a little bit below uh, zero Celsius. So it's, it's a specific range of temperatures and those temperatures st can still occur in warming climates. Eventually, if you've got warmer, the scale that's been discussed here with paleo records, then the extreme snowfall does fall off rapidly. But on you know, the next 100 years or so, you do see some changes, but it's, it's much less so than the kind of annual total snowfall. So these extremes of snowfall, we expect to persist around. And there's so much variability in them, it's hard to detect a clear signal from uh, anthropogenic climate change. Great. So, I want to bring us to a little bit of a broader question here. Um, we're at MIT, and a lot of people think about technologies. Uh, so we have a question about what types of sensing or other technologies will be most helpful in reducing uncertainties in climate modeling? Anyone here? I can talk about it. I mean, I mean the, the first answer is actually kind of boring. You just, you just want continuous measurements of the energy budget at the top of the atmosphere. And continuous measurements means you want to sustain them for a long time. So often the best thing you can do is build another version of the instrument that's already in space and fly it, fly it again for longer. And some of that we need to do. But there's also a bit more interesting part. I mean, again, if you take clouds, we have only global cloud data since about 2006. So it's a relatively short period extending its cloud-based radar and LIDAR, so it's basically weather radar flown on a satellite that gives us global measurements, extending those measurements further so that we can start seeing climate trends, that we can use, that we can use them to calibrate climate models will be very valuable. And then, of course, the big new thing, I think, in, in space is small satellites of all, all forms. So I think you need the big buses, a cloud-based radar is a fairly elaborate instrument, or the ones that are flying at least, but if you supplement that by a fleet of smaller instruments that are maybe not as accurate, each one of them, but give you larger temporal and spatial coverage, and you combine the more high precision measurements with the lower precision measurements that might have larger coverage, that might give us really great data to work with. 
and the way you would do the combining. It's again, there are machine learning techniques you can use that uh, essentially the same techniques, you know, all your phone cameras, they're not actually physically great cameras for the most part. I mean, they're pretty good, but <laughs> what makes the great pictures is the software there, right? That, um, that turns a fairly small lens into an amazing picture. And the same thing you can do with satellites, with nanosats, small satellites in general, use software to generate good data. Well, I can add from the oceanic perspective. I mean, one of the challenges we have for the ocean observing system is that satellites more or less just see the surface. We have very little information about what's happening inside the ocean. And we've actually seen a revolution in our ability to observe the oceans in the last 20 years. And one of those uh, revolutions was triggered by little autonomous buoys we call the Argo Array. These are buoys about this size, about this. And we have now several thousand of them actually in the ocean. And they pop up and down from the surface to about 2,000 meters every 10 days. At the moment, they take measurements of temperature and salinity primarily and pressure. And uh, this observation has actually been one of the cornerstones actually in our ability to constrain one of the most important pieces that actually helps us to constrain the climate sensitivity, which is the ocean heat uptake. So we've, thanks to these observations, we have now much, much, much better understanding of how the ocean is taking up the heat, where it's taking up the heat. And don't forget, that's about 95% of the total heat that's generated in the Earth system from the additional greenhouse gases actually goes in the ocean. That's why it's such a relevant problem. And now we're looking sort of at, at the ability to project forward, and we're thinking about adding new sensors, oxygen sensors, nitrate sensors, sensors that also look at biology. And I think there is a big push is needed, and I think we're just at the beginning. We have some uh, initial successful deployment of such sensors, uh, but I think this is a huge potential uh, out there for developing these sensors to think about how to make them stable. Just imagine you have to put something out in the ocean. It has to work for seven years. It doesn't, it's not allowed to consume a lot of power, and it has to be accurate and stable over that period. That's a real engineering chemical uh, sort of challenge, and I think we should take it up. Great. Ray. Yeah, I'd like to expand uh, the scope a little bit beyond just hardware and just point out that if you want to improve climate models, uh, you need to understand uh, what your various improvements are doing in the models. And so the business of building climate models is not just a matter of, of putting more and more encrusted features into them. It's, it's a business of making climate models flexible enough that you can do creative things, creative idealized experiments. And so there's an important uh, technological issue with software design. Uh, current generations of, cl of climate models are, are generally written, and I have to hold my nose, Fortran. Uh, and, uh, and, and we hold our nose and we code in Fortran, but, uh, uh, but uh, it, it does make it, it does limit the flexibility with which you can use climate models and with which different groups can trade model components. Now there's increasing interest in more uh, advanced programming languages. I like Python myself. There's even more increasing interest in the use of Julia. But uh, beyond which language you choose to use, correct object-oriented coding style uh, in order to learn how to, uh, how to make um, model components work together and tradable is extremely important. And so, so there's a whole vast uh, array of software, uh, software engineering that should complement whatever we're doing in terms of, uh, of improving our climate models, uh, our, our parameterizations and, and physics and the models. Okay, top one. Maybe to follow up on that and amplify a little bit, I, I agree with what Ray said and everyone else said. Um, we already have great data. There, there's an expression that people who, would, if, who collect data use is that the data, data drop to the ground. The data are there, but they're not used as extensively as they could be used if we had models that are coded more flexibly, that they're more built to learn from data. And I think that's the first thing we have to do, make use of what we already have with better algorithmic tools, better software tools, and the like. And again, I think this climate prediction problem we have to solve in the next five to 10 years and there is not going to be the crucial piece of data coming on that short time scale that will solve that for us. So it has to be every, combining everything mm -hmm. else. So I want to stay on the theme of technologies for a bit and move us to think about, think a little bit more about solutions. Uh, so I have a question about how the performance of current CO2 tap, capture technologies relates to natural capture by plants. So at the, as I mentioned earlier, plants mostly forests, take about a quarter of the total emissions. So total emissions is 10 petagrams of carbon right now. So uh, uptake by forest, about 2.5 petagrams of carbon per day. In Switzerland, we have a, 
a company called Climeworks, <laughs> and they're so probably one of the world's leaders in capturing technology. So directly capturing CO2 from, from the air and converting them into liquid CO2 that then at the moment is being used to mostly fertilize a greenhouse or to actually carbonate water. But ultimately, of course, the long-term idea of capturing CO2 from the air is that you either use it to produce synthetic fuels so that can substitute normal regular fossil fuels, particularly, for example, in the aviation industry, uh, or the other alternative option is to put that CO2 in the ground. At the moment, the capacity that they have, there are about 16 of these collectors, each of those absorbs about one ton of CO2 per year. And we heard earlier today uh, from Susan Solomon how much CO2 each of us is emitting. And so as a Swiss person, we're about in a 10 tons of CO2. So I have 10 collectors of them have to operate every year in order to compensate my emissions. Uh, the average uh, American citizen here emits about 20. Hmm? So they have 20 of those collectors. So that means the current capacity, installed capacity of this technology is equivalent to the emissions of an, American, uh, an average American, one person. So I think this technology is going to be incredibly important. I mean, I think I, I have no question. But we're at the very, very beginning. You know, sort of the, the first letter has been written of a, of a book. Hmm? So that's, I think, where we are in terms of the scaling up of what needs to happen in this, in this area. So don't rely on this for the next 10 years. So to, to follow up with the science question, I actually wanted to kick it to Ray okay. anyway, um, to ask what determines the budget for a two degrees Celsius target. Oh, yes. So actually, uh, so, yeah, Susan uh, 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 introduced the notion of cumulative carbon, carbon budget, uh, carbon budget. And so, so there's the, there is this very curious uh, cancellation between the, a nonlinearity in the amount, uh, in the partitioning of carbon between ocean and atmosphere, and a nonlinearity in the radiative forcing, the infrared effect of carbon dioxide and climate, which cancel each other out, which has the net effect that, uh, that uh, the um, uh, warming you get uh, is uh, almost linearly proportional to the total amount of carbon you emit into the atmosphere in the form of CO2 over all time. And that number in, in round numbers is that one trillion tons of one trillion tons of carbon in the form of carbon dioxide corresponds to a two degree warming with roughly a 50 percent prob probability. And so the, the main thing that, uh, that determines, the, the main thing that actually determines your carbon budget uh, for, say, two degrees of warming. And I should say that of that trillion tons, we've now emitted more than 600 million. And so we, we, we've used most of our uh, allowable carbon budget. But the, but the main things that, that, the main uncertainty, the two main uncertainties that determine your carbon budget are, are the same climate feedbacks we've been talking uh, about all, all along, because that determines how much warming you get for a certain amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. The ocean chemistry determines how where the CO2 goes once you put it into the atmosphere. So, so all the same climate uncertainties uh, that, that come from those feedback uncertainties, they go into the estimate of your, of your carbon budget. But in addition, something that is really on the frontier is the question of what happens to the land carbon cycle uh, as, uh, after you stop uh, emitting carbon dioxide. Our, our notions that, 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 mi that millennia of flat temperature that you get uh, in, the, in the results Susan showed after you stop emitting carbon, that's really based on, on o our understanding of inorganic ocean carbon uptake. Uh, and uh, we, we really don't know what land carbon is going to do once we stop emitting carbon dioxide. We've massively thrown the land terrestrial carbon cycle uh, out of equilibrium, which is one of the reasons why the land is able to take up so much carbon. But, uh, but after we stop emitting carbon dioxide, uh, it's, uh, we will probably lose that land sink but what may be worse, all that carbon that has been stocked on land may be given back to the atmosphere, and maybe it won't stop there. There's a lot of carbon uh, stored on land in the form of permafrost and so forth. And so, so uh, I'd say our biggest uncertainty in carbon budget, the biggest known unknown uh, beyond the, the cloud feedbacks and things like that, is exactly what is going to happen to the land carbon, cy carbon cycle after we stop emitting CO2. So bringing this back to a big picture question, do you believe there's a realistic chance that we'll be able to avoid two degrees Celsius warming? <laughs> I was about to ask that. 
Uh, actually, I'm, I'm interested in hearing the other people's answer, but <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that right, it's important to, to keep in mind when you talk about these budgets, you said it's a 50% chance, right? It's not like a budget, if you emit these trillion tons, you stay under two degrees guaranteed. It's just a 50% chance based on the previous generation of climate models. Now, there are new models coming out. As I said, they're more sensitive to increased CO2. They seem to be more sensitive to, to the air pollution, which, as you ramp down emissions, will also disappear. If you take these two together, that already makes it less likely than we previously thought that we have a trillion tons to avoid two degrees. Now, factor in latency in the energy system. It has, you know, energy systems have about the agility of an oil tanker. You can't just turn this around on the spot. The, the, the latency that Susan mentioned in ocean heat release, I mean, it's physically possible to avoid two degrees, but realistically possible, I don't think so. Yeah, well, I think the nature of a prediction is that it's always wrong. Uh, so at the risk, so we heard good arguments for why it's going to be very difficult. And I would add another sort of element. If you look actually at the rate of decarbonization that we need in, uh, in order to get essentially to the two degree, not to overeat the carbon budget we have available, we're talking about five to six percent a year decarbonization rate. And that is just unprecedented. I mean, we don't have an analog in the past where we have actually substituted one technology with another one, with the exception perhaps of cell phones or something like that. But in an existing system that, that is so core of, of, of how our society, our economy works, and then to change something which is so much at the core at the rate of 6% of the year uh, reduction, I think that's going to be awfully difficult. Personally, I think the most likely scenario is that we're going to look at an overshoot scenario, so we will not be able to um, reduce our emissions fast enough. I think we, that should not stop us, of course, to try as hard as possible. We think we need to have every single iota of our society needs to think about this problem and, and deal accordingly. We, we're going to be overshooting. I'm optimistic that the, the carbon removal technologies I, I, I alluded to before both the natural ones, for example, using uh, forest systems, but also other ecosystems, will help us tend to bring the CO2 down in a way that would prevent actually sort of this long-term um, uh, irreversibility that Susan Solomon is talking about. So I'm moderately optimistic. For an yes. overshoot scenario, though. For an overshoot scenario, yes. Yeah. Ray. Yeah, well, uh, I would say first, despair is not an option, because <laughs> if you just despair and throw in the towel, you know you have zero chance of solving the problem. It's going to be... <laughs> and and it, it's going to be massively hard. And in some uh, video I made, I refer to this as humanity's final exam. Do we act... We've, humanity's never faced a challenge like this. And if we, if we can't do this, we won't fulfill our des destiny. Now, I'll say in terms of reasons for optimism, th there's no question technologically, even without more technology, it is possible to do this without trashing the world economy. Uh, but it, uh, uh, it, it is unquestionably true that with better technology, the problem becomes more feasible. And so it requires a combination of policy and political will and technology uh, and economics that favors the deployment of the technology, we already have new technology to do this. But I want to emphasize that, that uh, even if we do not, uh, even if we don't think we can halt uh, warming at two degrees, we absolutely have to run, go as hard as we can to decarbonize the economy because we don't run out of coal and oil at the point when we put our trillion tons in the atmosphere and hit two degrees. There is still enough coal and oil out there to actually have 10 degrees, almost certainly, and maybe more uh, uh, e uh, if the climate sensitivity is higher than, than the current, current midline. So even if we, uh, so things will be horrible with two degree warming, but they'll be even more horrible, nonlinearly more horrible at four degrees. So, so, uh, so we just have to run as fast as we can and, um, and uh, li live with the consequences of our failures. Yes, Follow absolutely. Up on that briefly, I, just, I read an article, I think it was in the New Yorker uh, recently, that kind of implied that two degrees there would be such tipping points, there was no point in caring what happens beyond that. Yeah. And I think all the science we've been talking about here just kind of scales up whether yeah. how nonlinear the response is, but yeah. it doesn't, there's no suggestion that we shouldn't 
yeah. give up beyond a certain point, right? It, it just yeah. increases Clim in yeah. amplitude. Yeah, climate change yeah. exists on a continuum of harm, and you want to stay as long as you can. Exactly. Yeah. So you mentioned technology and economics. What are the most important collaborations between disciplines in climate science? That's an interesting <laughs> one, yeah. Which, I mean, I think one thing that has come up at MIT lately with the college computing and so forth is how can we get more interactions between computer scientists and um, climate scientists, climate model builders, and so forth. And so that maybe is not a, a big interaction currently, but could be one. So that would be for the future somewhere where we need more interactions. Yeah. David? Uh, you know, if oh, you, I was just going to say, you know, we all study, you know, the, the potential for nonlinear change in the climate system, the physical climate system and the, the biogeochemical climate system. You know, obviously we need to be also working with people who understand the capacity for nonlinear change in social and economic systems as well. And, um, and, and in the paleo record, you know, we have many examples of human societies that have dealt with more localized changes in their climate. And there are examples of resilience and such that we can potentially, you know, use as, use as models. Yeah. Now, uh, in terms of, of uh, in terms of important uh, collaborations and cross fertilization, I think uh, uh, interchange in, in the uh, the nexus of of uh, modern chemistry, uh, geochemistry, earth sciences, atmospheric sciences. That's very powerful when it comes to finding strategies for carbon capture from air capture. Uh, and now we don't know whether this will ever be economically feasible, but there's almost no money going into investment in research on it right now. And, uh, and it could be a backstop technology that, that's extremely valuable. But, the, but uh, the, the Earth has natural ways of removing excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the long term, which is what regulates our climate over on a time scale of billions of years. And so a lot has been learned about, uh, uh, about the natural reactions that, uh, that turn carbon dioxide into limestone and various minerals. And there's a very productive effort, for example, uh, at the Oxford uh, Earth Science Department in trying to figure out how you can use technology to accelerate these natural reactions. Uh, which gives you a, a nice, stable place to put your carbon dioxide. But the reason I was uh, a little f fishing around for different, you know, for collaborations, I think that actually, uh, really, it's an energy technology that uh, that in the short term we 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 could see the most uh, uh, fertile ground for new collaborations. Uh, tr transforming things in terms of you know better battery technology uh, uh, and, and you know smarter grids and things like that and those are not primarily collaborations that involve atmospheric scientists but other areas uh, other areas uh, from mechanical engineering to smart materials and so forth. Right. Well, we're almost out of time. I want to get um, get one last question in. Given this panel is about the frontiers of climate science, to talk about what the future of climate science really looks like. Um, we'll have plenty of questions to occupy researchers decades into the future, and the world really needs a next generation of researchers to help us understand and explain the changed climate. The vast majority of MIT undergraduates, more than 85%, don't look like the demographics of this panel. So what I'm going to ask you is how you personally are making sure that the climate science community is an attractive place for the next generation of researchers who might not look like you. <laughs> well, I mean... I, <laughs> Well, uh, it's interesting to look. Uh, so we we're in an er we're working in an area that's been around for more than a hundred years, uh, and and it's it's grown, but it's a, a fairly mature area. Uh, uh, the main area I'm working in right now is in climate of exoplanets, which uh, didn't exist ten years ago, and so just as an indication of how how there are opportunities in rapid growth areas of field, I just ran uh, one of the major international meetings at Oxford, Exoclimes on climate of exoplanets. Uh, more than half of our invited keynote speakers were women, and, and about half of our, of our participants were, were women. So we're doing very well on gender diversity, and in an area uh, where there's a big influx of new, of new talent, you have the chance to rectify whatever biases there were in the system. Uh, and um, so how to make that happen within the rest of climate science uh, is, is an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, to follow up on that, uh, you know, we're going to have a, a meteorological society, American Meteorological Society meeting in Boston in, in January, and at those meetings, I can't remember the exact numbers, but 
uh, 50 or 60 percent of the graduate students are, are female, uh, but obviously as you go older in the field, uh, that those numbers change, and so whether the, how much of that is a, a delayed inertia effect or some other issue is, is worth talking about and working on. David, do you want to have the last? Uh, I was just going to say, you know, continuing to learn as a mentor. You know, mm -hmm. that the, the not using our own necessarily experience of being mentored as as indicative of how one should should mentor every, each and every student, and being willing to not know. Well, I think continuing to learn is a great uh, topic to end on. So I want to thank again our panelists. Yeah. Yeah.